Welcome. Uh, welcome to this talk, video-based cryptanalysis, extracting cryptographic keys from video footage of a device's power LED. I see that uh, a great number of people decided to uh, attend this talk, uh, and this is very impressive considering the fact that you have additional very beautiful talks now you are uh, taking place in parallel. Uh, with a great number of audience comes great expectations, and uh, you should know that we will do our best in order to convince you that you did uh, the right decision attending this talk. With that in mind, I will start by introducing my, uh, ourselves. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a Black Hat Bolt member of uh, Europe and uh, Singapore. This is my fourth Black Hat talk. I work as a freelancer consultant and also I do postdoc at Cornell Tech and I have a PhD in security and privacy. Together with me is Itai Iluz, a Master of Science student from the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Now, a few words about this talk. Uh, this talk relies on two recently published uh, papers. Uh, the first one is video-based cryptanalysis, and the second one is optical cryptanalysis. You can find them online if you look for them. Um, no prior knowledge of cryptography is required to understand this talk, okay? Some of the details about the implementations of the attack aren't covered in this talk. You can find them in the paper if you want. Now, with that in mind, let's have some fun. Okay, so here's a question for the audience. What do you associate with the, with the term cryptanalysis? Okay? Now, many of you probably associate quantum computers or even data centers. And in general, you think about high level of computing capabilities. Others might associate specialized hardware, like, for example, oscilloscope. Probably some of you also think about supply chain attacks and complex attacks in general, and also the name of some sp uh, special agencies might arise as well. But here is an interesting fact. I believe that the vast majority of you do not associate this iPhone with the term cryptanalysis. And this is because that smartphones provide weak computing capabilities. They are very popular device. Each and every one of you owns at least one. They cannot be used to apply complex attacks. And most of you do not consider yourself as an entity capable of recovering cryptographic keys or to conduct cryptanalysis. And this is, my, this is our message to you. Think again, OK? You should think again about your smartphones in the context of cryptanalysis. By the end of this talk, we will convince you that power LEDs pose a great risk to information confidentiality and that popular video cameras, such as those integrated to your smartphones and other video cameras that you uh, might hijack over the, by applying cyber attacks over the internet, provide the needed infrastructure to exploit this risk and to recover cryptographic uh, keys from a device by analyzing uh, its, uh, a video footage of its power LED. Okay? Now, this is very surprising, and probably most of you wonder where exactly or how uh, the idea of using a video camera to recover secret keys from a device, a power LED, come from. And with that in mind, let's discuss the work that we did throughout the last uh, few years. I want to convince you that uh, we already did the needed progress in order to think about this idea. So in 2013, a group of researchers from MIT presented a visual microphone. They presented a speech recovery technique from a video footage by analyzing the movement of an object from the video footage, okay? They demonstrated it on a various object. Uh, one of them is uh, a bag of chips. And they were able, able to recover an audible speech by analyzing the movement of a bag of chips from the video footage. Now, they did it um, using high-frequency video camera capable of recovering uh, 20,000 frames per second. And they also did it with the use of a regular camera by exploiting the rolling shutter. And we will discuss rolling shutters later on in this uh, talk. In 2016, I started my PhD at uh, 
uh, the end of uh, 2016. And after a few years, I started to play with, uh, uh, with LEDs and with light and some additional stuff. And in Black at, in Black at 2020, we published Lemphon. It was back then uh, a virtual event, Black at uh, USA 2020. We demonstrated the method to recover speech using a photodiode, okay? The photodiode, photodiode is what you, what you can see on the right side. It's an optical sensor that converts light into electricity, okay? You don't get a picture. It only converts light into electricity and you digitize the, uh, the, the electricity using an A2D. And we show that using measurements obtained by a photodiode, we can analyze the movement of a desktop light bulb in response to, uh, to a sound in order to recover speech. And we recovered speech from various distances, from, five, from 15 meters, 25 meters, and 35 meters away. As you can see, the photodiode was mounted to a telescope. The telescope was directed to the light bulb that you can see that is standing on the desktop. And we played uh, speech from the speakers that you can see in here. Now, I want to play to you the, the speech recoveries in order to convince you that you can actually convert um, optical measurements to speech at high quality. You are about to hear the uh, um, original statement and then recoveries from 15 meters, 25 meters, and 35 meters away. We will make America great again. This is the original. Okay, I hope that you were able to uh, hear the, the speech recovery. In one of the experiments that we conducted, we also uh, found out that not only we can recover speech from the by obtaining optical measurements from the light bulb itself, we can also recover speech by obtaining optical measurements from the power LED of the speakers that were used to project the, 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 uh, the sound. And we conducted another research that we named uh, the GLOM attack. It was published at CCS 2021, where we demonstrated speech recovery by analyzing the intensity of the power LED of the speakers, and we recovered the speech that was played by the speakers, okay? Again, we recovered speech from various distances between five to 35 meters away. You can see it's the same idea. A photodiode is mounted uh, into this uh, telescope, which is directed in this specific case to the power LED of the speakers. Let me play to you the speech recoveries. We will make America great again. 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 Okay, this is very surprising, even with respect to the previous uh, studies that I've just uh, the, uh, discussed, which are Lemphone and Visual Microphone. The reason is, in this specific case, the intensity of the power LED of the speakers was used to recover speech, okay? So we try to understand why exactly the intensity of a speaker's power LED be used to recover speech. And in order to answer this question, we conducted an experiment where um, we used the USB speakers to play a frequency scan between zero to four kilohertz, and we obtained a power trace from uh, the USB connector of the speakers, and we also obtained optical measurements using the photodiode from the power LED of the speakers. Now, the results or the spectrograms extracted from the uh, optical measurements and the power measurements you can find them uh, at the bottom of the slide. And we made a few observations. I would say that the most interesting one is the fact that the power consumption correlates with the intensity of the power LED. Now, this is very interesting, but an immediate question that arises is, is this correlation between the intensity of the power LED and the power consumption can also be seen in additional speakers, or is it just limited to this specific model that we've used? So we repeated the exact same experiment, this time 
with additional uh, speakers. You can see, you can find here uh, Google's uh, Assistant, also Sony speakers, and uh, you can find Logitech and Creative as well. Interestingly, you can see that the intensity of the power head of various speakers, okay, correlates with the power consumption in the range of zero to four kilohertz. Okay, it's a universal phenomenon. Probably some of you are wondering why this correlation exists. And uh, the reason is that in some electrical circuits, the integrated power LED is connected directly to the power line, okay? And dedicated means intended to decouple the optical and the power correlation are either not integrated to the circuit, or in some cases they are integrated to the circuit, but they are ineffective. As a result, the power consumption of the device, which is essentially the power supply to the integrated power LED, affects the intensity of the LED. And as a result, the optical measurements reflect the power consumption of the device. Now, eventually, after a few additional studies that I did, uh, I decided to leverage these findings, the understanding that there's a correlation between the power consumption and the optical uh, measurements uh, of the LED uh, to conduct root analysis, to recover secret keys uh, instead of uh, recovering uh, speech. And this has actually led us to uh, uh, optical cryptanalysis, which is a research that we published at, uh, it is about to be published in CCS 2023. Optical cryptanalysis um, recovers secret keys from a device by obtaining um, optical measurements from its power LED. As you can see in this specific picture, we took a Raspberry Pi, directed a photodiode towards the LED of the Raspberry Pi, and one of the most interesting observations that we made at the beginning was that the intensity of the power LED of various devices, okay, correlates with the power consumption of the device in much wider spectrum that we initially analyzed, okay? In order to conduct speech recovery, we only need to uh, have this correlation in zero to four kilohertz, and this was, uh, we didn't try to uh, test this correlation, whether it uh, goes in a wider uh, bandwidth. In reality, it goes even well be, uh, beyond the 500 kilohertz. This was the upper limit of the um, equipment that we've used. Moreover, we conducted an additional experiment where we um, executed some RSA decryptions on the Raspberry Pi while obtaining optical measurements from the photodiode. This is very interesting. We were able to distinguish between RSA decryptions and the slip operations, okay? Essentially, as you can see, we can detect the beginning and the end of cryptographic operations performed by the CPU of the device. Now, this is very bad in terms of security, okay? This actually opens a window to a new type of uh, attacks, which are cryptanalytic timing attacks that were already suggested and relied on power measurements, okay, in order to recover secret keys. And by using a photodiode, we were, also, we were uh, able to recover an RSA, ECDSA, and even side keys from various devices, not only from this uh, Raspberry Pi. Now, this is very interesting. However, the primary disadvantage of this specific uh, uh, method and the method that I've showed you uh, so far is the fact that photodiodes are not commonly used sensors, okay? The vast majority of you, despite the, the, the fact that this is a biased uh, crowd, a biased audience, which is a technological audi audience, do not own a photodiode as the photodiode that we used. Okay, moreover, it requires to connect the photodiode into an A2D. Okay, this is not something which I consider as an ideal equipment for attacker to conduct cryptanalysis. So the idea uh, was to uh, perform cryptanalysis, but instead of using a photodiode, using ubiquitous uh, video cameras, okay? Again, ubiquitous, not professional, a video camera that you either integrated to your smartphone or um, 
can be hijacked over the internet. Okay? Now, with that in mind, I will let you try to continue and explain the flat models. Take it from here. Um, first, what is our objective? We want to perform cryptanalysis. We want to recover secret keys from devices, power LEDs, using video cameras and not with uh, photodiodes. So let's discuss the threat model. The, the first threat model is the closed video acquisition. Uh, this threat model is, uses a smartphone's video camera. It targets any type of power LED and it, re it requires a physical access to the device. You must have the device nearby. However, by the other uh, <clears throat> threat model, the over the internet video acquisition, uh, it uses internet connected video cameras. Uh, it targets only type two power, power LED, which are power LED that changes their color or uh, status in response to an operation that performed by the device. It is commonly used in the smart card readers, and which is pretty amazing, it can be applied remotely over the internet using a hijacked video camera. So, so far, uh, we have used photodiodes. These are analog sensors, they be, can sample at a few gigahertzes. However, we know that most of the video cameras can record only 60 or 120 frames per second. We know that this sampling rate is not sufficient enough to perform cryptanalysis. So how can we overcome this? <clears throat> so let's talk about the rolling shutter. Um, we used to think that a picture or an image is a result of one atomic snapshot taken by the video camera. However, we know it's, it's not true. Actually, 99.9% .9 of the video cameras, uh, including the one you have on your own pockets in your smartphones, uh, record a video using a rolling shutter method. Th that is mean that a single picture is a result of multiple snapshots taking at different times, and not one multiple snapshot. Usually, the rolling shutter scans the object vertically or horizontally um, and combines the scan pieces into a one uh, single frame. Usually it rows, so it means that every row or every group of rows at the image is not exposed to the object at the same time. So how can we take advantage of, take advantage of it to perform, uh, to increase our sampling rate? So first let's visualize it. On the left side, we can see uh, a moving circle and how it looks to uh, a human eye. And on the right side, we can see how it looks through a rolling shutter camera. We, see, we can see that there is a distortion that is the result of the rolling shutter effect. The fact that every row or every group of, every group of rows is not exposed to the object at the same time is the cause to these distortions, and it usually appears in pictures of fast-moving objects. So let's see how we can increase our sampling rate. <clears throat> so we, uh, we have conducted an, an experiment. We programmed an Arduino to turn its power LED on and off every 250 microseconds. We filmed it with a um, 60 frame per second camera. It looks constant to human eye, to the, to the camera, and this is because of the sampling rate. We could not, could, could not detect the flickering LED because the sampling, sampling rate is not sufficient enough. So what we have done, we have placed an extra lens between the <clears throat> Samsung Galaxy camera and the uh, power LED of the Arduino. So the view of the LED fills the entire frame. So we got this video, this very interesting video on the right side. Um, we can see uh, the red and the black stripes. And now what is very interesting is that we can actually now detect the four kilohertz flicker LED. This is because we filled the, <clears throat> the view of the camera with the power LED and because of the fact 
that every row on the picture is not exposed to the object at the same time, we now could detect the flickering LED. We, this is one frame of the bottom right taken from the video, and you can see the red and the black stripes where the power LED was on and off. Uh, so this is allow us, allows us to detect the four kilohertz flicker, and so by taking every <coughs> uh, sample as a, as a row or group of rows instead of a full frame, we could increase our sampling rate from 60 measurements per second, which is the frame per second rate of the camera, to the rolling shutter rate, which is 60K measurements per second. Another thing that we should take into account is that in reality, the cameras, they have delay time. There is a transition time between two consecutive frames. So uh, du during this, this time, nothing is captured by the video camera. So we should take this into account when we analyze the video footage of the power LED. And now I, I will let Ben to discuss the ECDSA key recovery. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Itai. Okay, let's discuss briefly uh, the Minerva attack in order to understand how we recover the uh, complete ECDSA key. And the Minerva attack was introduced three years ago by a group of researchers that found that the implementation of the ECDSA on elliptic curve 256 R1 uh, in the many cryptographic libraries applies some runtime optimizations, okay? In reality, the number of iterations of the main loop that you can see uh, on the right side is determined by the number of leading zeros in the nonce. As a result, it created a time dependency between the number of leading zeros in the nonce and the execution time of the main loop, which essentially determined the ECDSA running time. Okay? And the Minerva attack introduce a new uh, timing attack to recover the complete ECDSA key based on the number of leading zeros in the nonces of a set of signatures. You need to have about 4,000 signatures in order to recover the complete ECDSA key out of it. The original Minerva attack required the attackers to obtain the timing measurements uh, from the CPU of the host machine. Essentially, it required the attackers to compromise the host machine with the malware in order to obtain the uh, uh, timing measurements from the CPU. The others were unable to demonstrate the attack uh, applied over the internet, and this is because the noise added by the network latency. Okay, the Minerva attack is very sensitive to errors in, uh, in uh, the timing of the ECDSA uh, signature. Now, the Minerva attack, you can think about it as a black box, okay? The implementations, if the specifics of the implementation can be found in the paper. It's a black box that receives as an input about 4,000, a set of uh, signatures and their associated uh, ECDSA uh, timing, okay? And it recovers the complete ECDSA key out of it. Um, essentially, the question is, how can the ECDSA signing time of a signature be estimated from a video? If we can estimate the ECDSA signing time from a video, we can operate or we can use the black box uh, uh, implementation of the Minerva to recover the ECDSA key. So in order to recover uh, the ECDSA key using video footage, uh, we applied the next steps. Okay, first of all, uh, before the steps that we applied, this was the experimental setup. We placed an internet connected video camera 60 meters away from this de uh, desktop. On top of this desktop, uh, you can see there's uh, a smart card reader and a smart card inserted into it. And we wanted to recover the ECDSA key from the smart card using video footage of the power LED of the smart card reader obtained by the internet connected video camera. This is the experimental setup. Um, let me play to you the video so you, you will be able to see it. We zoom into the LED in order to fill the LED, uh, the, the view of the, uh, the, the frame with the view of the LED. 
As you can see on the left picture, we actually uh, use the right LED, which gives us indication regarding the, the activity being done. Uh, when it, its color is blue, it means that nothing is being done by the, uh, by the smart card. And when its color is, uh, it's, when it's off, it means that the smart card is being used to sign. Now, um, let me show to you again the video. You can see it on the right side. And as you can see, there's differences that you can detect by the human eye between blue and uh, black, which indicates whether it was used to sign or was in an idle mode. And you can see that by averaging each row in a frame into a single value, and again, arranging them in a time series, we can distinguish between the sign operations where the power LED is off and the idle operations where the color of the power LED is blue, okay, uh, based on the blue channel. You can just set a threshold and detect whether it was uh, used to sign or whether it was in idle mode. Now, the main question that we need to answer is how can we uh, calculate the signing time out of it? So in order to calculate the ECDSA signing time, we did, or we applied the next steps. First of all, we extracted the series of frames associated with each signature from the video. Next, we kept only series uh, that, uh, of, uh, of uh, frames that contain the indication of the switch between the beginning and uh, uh, the end of the signing, okay? Meaning that uh, we kept only series that uh, in their frames, we could detect the beginning, the change, the switch from idle to sign and vice versa from uh, sign to idle, okay? You can see this is the first series that you can see on top. We filtered any series that uh, missed or lacks one of these uh, indications, okay? And this is due to uh, the, the, uh, the fact that um, the Minerva uh, attack is very sensitive to errors in the timing uh, measurements. And in this specific case, if I mentioned it earlier, the switches happened in the transition time and not in the scanning time. The transition time is the time between two frames where the object or the scene isn't captured by any frame, okay? It's what we consider as the dead time. Now next, we calculated T1. T1 is the number of frames filled completely with black, okay? And we uh, calculated T1 by counting the number of frames that are completely filled with black and multiplying them by this constant. T2, on the other hand, is the execution time of the first frame in which the color uh, has changed. We calculated it by counting the number of rows that uh, are uh, in uh, black color and divided uh, them by the number of rows in the frame, okay? We multiplied them by S, which stands for the scanning time, and added the T, which is the transition time. Now, so far, we just discussed about the scanning time and the transition time, but we did not discuss on how to detect them or how to determine them. So I'm, I remind you the uh, experiment that we did with the Flickr of the Arduino. You just need to repeat the exact same experiment that we did. Count the number of changes in this specific uh, frame between um, black and red and multiply it by the period of time that the Flickr was either on and off, okay? This gives you the scanning time. And the beauty of it is when you determine the scanning time, you can determine uh, the uh, transition time by deducting the scanning time from this, con from this uh, uh, constant. Now, with the knowledge of the scanning time and the transition time, we can now calculate T1. And T2, which is uh, the execution time of the last frame in which the color changed from um, signing into idle, is given by uh, T3, which again, the same calculation for uh, T2, but in this case, we do not add the transition time because it's ended before uh, in the middle of the frame. So the transition time happened only after the, the signing uh, has happened, okay? And if the signing time is the sum of T1, T2, and T3. Now, if you will do it for enough signatures, as you can see in here, this is the script of the Minerva. You can see that the script recovers the complete 
ECDSA key from the video footage obtained by the internet connected video camera that was located 16 meters away from the smart card. Okay? And interestingly, there are at least six smart card readers that are available on Amazon that are vulnerable to this attack. We were able to recover the ECDSA key from six different smart card readers, uh, but with varied uh, distances due to their uh, intensity of the power LED. Okay, now let's discuss how to recover uh, a Psyche from a device. Um, and in order to discuss about recovering Psyches, I want us to discuss about the Hertzbeat attack. The Hertzbeat attack published last year, okay? Uh, the guys presented the Hertzbeat attack, introduced a timing attack to recover a Psyche from a device, and they exploited the fact that in various devices, the DVFS, or the, which stands for Dynamic Voltage Frequency Stabilizer, yields different execution times based on the data being processed by the device. Okay? This is a different type of, uh, uh, yeah, of uh, timing leakage. The previous timing leakage was the result of the implementation of the code. This is the result of the execution of the code. And for each index, uh, uh, attackers can craft a dedicated cryptogram, okay, using the recovered bits, the, the bits that they already recovered. It's an adaptive attack, okay? Uh, and determine the value of the bit based on some timing threshold that they learned at the beginning. Okay, again, a timing attack to recover the bits of a key. Now, the original attack was implemented using uh, timing measurements obtained by querying the API of a server, by deducting the uh, request time from the response time. And again, due to the noise added by the network latency, it took a lot of days to recover the key from the server. This is what we wanted to do, okay? We wanted to recover the secret key from the Samsung Galaxy S8. It's the smartphone that you can see on the right side, not the one uh, on the top. This is the smartphone that holded the side key that we wanted to recover. Now, this smartphone was connected to the USB hub where USB speakers were connected to the same USB hub as well, okay? The USB hub speakers and, and the Samsung Gal and the Galaxy were connected essentially to the same power line. Now, we wanted to recover the secret key from the Samsung Galaxy in this case, by obtaining video footage from the power LED of the speakers, of the connected speakers, okay? Not from the power LED of the Samsung Galaxy S8. And in order to make it funny, we used an iPhone to record the power LED of the speakers in order to recover the cryptographic key from the Samsung Galaxy S8. Okay, on the right side, I wanna show you how the LED of the speakers looks like. This was the, uh, among the video footage that we used in order to recover the key. You can see that in this specific case, it's completely, uh, it doesn't change its color in response to anything. You all have uh, USB speakers. You know that the uh, color seems to be, to the human eye, is something which is uh, fixed and doesn't change. Okay? And in reality, if you will observe the idle operations performed by the Samsung Galaxy and the psych operations performed by the Samsung Galaxy, uh, the video footage that was taken from the connected USB speakers, it looks uh, the same, okay? You cannot detect any uh, difference by the naked eye. However, we conducted an experiment where uh, we performed eight executions, uh, eight uh, uh, consecutive iterations of uh, psych operations, where each iteration consisted of 100 uh, psych operations, okay? We average each frame into a single value and again arrange them in a time series, okay? What you now can see is that we can detect the beginning and the end of the iterations by analyzing the green channel, okay? It's not surprising because the color of the uh, power LED of the speakers was green. And I think that you can understand that we can now calculate the iteration time based on the number of values that appear between the peaks because they, were, um, they, were, they are the result of averaging uh, the entire frame into a single value. 
Now, probably some of you are wondering, but how accurate is this calculation? So here are the results. You can see on the left side the results that were obtained or the distribution of the execution time based only on the first iteration, OK? This is very noisy. You cannot set a good threshold in order to detect the differences in the, uh, between the two possible states of the bit. However, uh, in the middle, you can see the distribution of the execution time based on the minimum uh, execution time among the eight iterations. OK, you can see now that you're actually capable of distinguishing between the two different states of the bit. OK, so by averaging, uh, by calculating the minimum of the eight iterations, again, per index, and setting a threshold of uh, 36.15, uh, to distinguish between the two possible uh, uh, states of the bit, we could detect the bit with a 99% accuracy. This is good, but this is not excellent, OK? And as a result, we need uh, to implement an error uh, detecting and, correct and correcting mechanism in order to uh, correct, uh, in order to, de to detect errors and correct them during the uh, recovery process, OK? And we implemented the exact same error, correcting, uh, error detection and correction uh, mechanism that was suggested by uh, uh, the authors of uh, Hertzblit. Again, you can find it online. Now, this is actually uh, the recoveries. We were able to recover the complete, EC, uh, the complete uh, psyche from the Samsung Galaxy S8 with the use of an error uh, detecting and correcting uh, mechanism. You can see the 21st bits and the last 30 bits, and you can see that uh, the timing threshold that actually divides between the two specific bits. Now, uh, let's discuss the limitations of this attack. Now, the attack mostly targets weak IoT devices up to a level of a smartphone, OK? I would be surprised if someone else will take the same video cameras that we used and will show me that he was able to recover a secret key from a laptop or from a server. Moreover, the uh, distribution of the sampling is not uniform, okay? It is not uniform due to the fact that you have that time between each and every two uh, consecutive frames. And these are the two primary limitations of the attack. Now, with that in mind, let's discuss the takeaways from the, this talk. First of all, I think that now you are convinced that PowerLeds are much more informative than you originally uh, imagined, okay? In some cases, PowerLed leaks uh, 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 PowerLeds uh, leak confidential information that can be used uh, to breach uh, a user's privacy and information confidentiality. Moreover, the potential of the attack is actually much greater than uh, I just showed you, okay? Attackers can use professional video cameras that provide higher rolling shutter rate, that provide a higher bit depth, and that are capable of providing enhanced zoom capabilities in order to apply their attacks, okay? We just use commonly used video cameras. Attackers can uh, use professional video cameras instead. And this is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting uh, uh, takeaways. We expect that more and more devices will be exposed to video-based uh, cryptanalysis each and every year. And this is the result of having video camera specifications continuously improving each and every year together with the fact that many more IoT devices or functional IoT devices being deployed among us each and every year, okay? Now, we will have um, improved uh, video cameras collocated with weak uh, IoT devices, okay? And this is why we expect that many more devices will be exposed to video-based script analysis each and every year. And this is the last takeaway. It might be easier, it's, it's for perspective, okay? It might be easier to compromise a target device with a malware and exfiltrate the key over the internet. However, video-based script analysis is intended to extract cryptographic keys from non-compromised device, okay? And this is done by using uh, a popular equipment. Now, with that in mind, thank you very much for attending our talk. Um, I will be happy to take questions from the audience if we have time in here or in the wrap room. This is it, thank you very much.